You're confident that's secure? Well, I'm semi-confident. <laughs> Here we go. Okay, Professor G, where are we? What's going on? What are we talking about today? Well, this is the second year lab, our teaching lab at the University of Nottingham, where our students generally do experiments. But today I'm here because I want to do a demonstration for this video about uh, an interesting new telescope that's just come online recently. What I like about this telescope is that it just rests on an idea that is simultaneously crazy but really simple. And it's the idea that you can make a telescope with a mirror made out of mercury by spinning a bowl full of mercury around. So the common picture of a telescope, if you think of a cartoon or something, is someone looking through a tube, maybe with some glass lenses. But for astronomers, our typical large telescope is a big bucket for collecting photons that usually has a very, very large reflective surface made out of glass. Glass polished very, very finely and often coated with some reflective coating that, that helps with the light gathering. But it's a big, solid piece. Now, we want to build telescopes that are bigger and bigger and bigger, but that brings with it technical problems. There's only so large a mirror you can construct. You start having to support it using active supports. Um, as you tilt it, gravity uh, causes some problems. It's really interesting to think about different ways in which we could build a telescope. So a group of astronomers, an international collaboration between astronomers from India, Canada, Poland, Belgium, and Uzbekistan, have recently constructed a working liquid mercury telescope high up in the Indian Himalayas. Now this is a telescope that has a reflecting surface, we'll call it a mirror, of a diameter of four meters across. That makes it a good-sized astronomical telescope, and it works by rotating a dish full of mercury to create naturally a shape that turns into a reflective body. So it takes light coming in from distant objects and it focuses it uh, in a way that we can collect it. Now we have some mercury here, thanks to our friends in chemistry. I was actually genuinely astonished by how heavy this vessel full of mercury is. But if we look at this smaller version here, you can see that it is very liquid, but also how beautifully shiny it is. So all we have to do is apply some very basic physics and we can create a beautiful reflective surface at a fraction of the cost of building the equivalent traditional telescope. The basic idea actually rests with Newton. I've got a copy of Newton's Principia, which is fundamental for our study of science, particularly around motion. And he actually writes, if we take a bucket hanging from a very large cord and turn around the cord so it's twisted tight and fill it with water, and then we let that go, he says, the water will gradually recede from the middle and rise up the sides of the vessel, assuming a concave shape. The concave shape is important because we want to be reflecting those incoming light waves. That's how a mirror works. We want to take those light waves coming from distant objects and then reflect them so that they come to a focus. And that's where we place our camera and we record our image. Newton didn't take this further all the way to thinking, oh, we could make a telescope out of this. He was, he was genuinely interested in ideas of motion, but other astronomers did. As early as the early 1900s, someone tried to make um, a reflective telescope out of mercury. And there are some technical challenges that made this more difficult. So it kind of rested for a while until the idea was picked up again in the 1980s. And then some actual working prototypes were made. Now, thanks to our wonderful technical staff here, I have a wonderful demonstration that will show exactly what Newton was on about and why um, this is helpful for astronomers. Are you gonna spin some mercury? 
I'm not going to spin some mercury because I think our health and safety um, officer would get a little bit uptight about that with good reason. Mercury is very dangerous. But I do have a cylinder of water here. It's painted black on the bottom, so it just kind of helps show us the shape. We've got a turntable here, and it's connected to something that's going to drive that. We've got this all set up so that if I press this button, it should rotate at the proper speed to produce the effect that we want. So it'll take a little while to get going, but if you come down sort of at eye level, you'll start to see that shape take shape. And it's not stabilized yet. We're gonna get further and further into a more perfect bowl shape. Now that bowl shape has a mathematical definition. This surface is a paraboloid. If I just slice through the middle, we would see that it is a perfect parabola. And a parabola is what we want for a reflecting telescope because... It, does, it doesn't look real, it's amazing. It doesn't look good. Yeah, yeah. I, I expected it to be a very subtle effect. It's really dramatic. No, and it doesn't take much. You can see this isn't going around that fast. I don't know, a couple of times per second. It doesn't take much to produce this effect. Can't believe it. And this is something our, our second year students will cover in a module where they learn about vector calculus and, and fields because this demonstration was set up to, to look at vortices and things like that. But it just happens to be the perfect demonstration for our liquid mirror telescope. So now you can imagine that if you replace that water with mercury, you have to do a little bit of technical work to stop the wobbling and, and other effects, but you're pretty much there. You know, you could make, you could, you could easily imagine how you could make a, a, a working mirror out of a liquid metal. Now, why would you want to do this? I think that's what Brady would ask me next. Yes, it is. <laughs> <laughs> um, well, telescopes are expensive. They are really, really expensive. And the bigger you get, the cost scales enormously as do the technical challenges, because you are suspending, essentially, a large piece of glass, or now as we build larger and larger telescopes, we use, we, we use segments of glass and put them together to form a large telescope. They weigh many, many tons, or tens of tons. They have to be steered around and pointed. It's difficult and expensive to make these optical components in the first place, let alone fix them on an infrastructure and, and move them around. So if you have something where you can just pour your mercury on, spin it up fairly gently, and as long as you can control very well all of the external effects, you can make yourself a, a, a pretty lightweight um, telescope. It's not without some drawbacks though. That's probably the next question. The first and biggest drawback is that you can only point straight up. And this is probably pretty obvious. You can imagine if I started tilting this, we wouldn't have our nice stationary surface. Uh, gravity is a, an important component of this construction here and it only points in one direction. So we can only point our telescope straight up, but that is not necessarily a bad thing. It really depends on what kind of science you want to do. If you go outside and you look straight up over the course of a night, it's called you're pointing at the zenith. And in fact, the first really big working liquid mercury telescope was called the Large Zenith Telescope, and it was located in British Columbia in Canada. It was about six meters in diameter. It's not a bad thing to just point straight up. You just have to make peace with the sky passing overhead and observing whatever comes into view rather than pointing at a specific object. So if I had a particular program, a particular object I wanted to look at, this might not be the right way to do it. But if I just wanted to observe a large patch of sky over and over again, this would be a great way to do survey astronomy. And in that way, we can sample the distant universe. We can also look for transient objects. You can, you can look at the same patch of sky night on night. That means you get to see quasars, you get to see supernova, you get to see potentially near-Earth asteroids, which might be of interest. So it fills a particular niche. Who knows what, where this is going? This is still early days for this telescope, but they have released images, they have released data, and their plans for a survey are underway. I thought these days, even doing that kind of exposure, you would need to have a little bit of movement of the telescope to sort of follow the movement of the sky. Yeah, so this is the next interesting bit about how these telescopes work. So you've got your dish 
and the dish is shaped so that it's, it's close to the shape of the parabola you want. That's just to save the amount of mercury. It's gravity and the rotation that drives the shape. You've got your mercury. The real thing is sitting on an air bearing to avoid vibrations. And then you've got the camera. You've got to record this somehow. Now, Brady has pointed out that the problem with stuff drifting across the sky is that you only get to see it for a short period of time. But here, we can use the technological advantage of using CCD cameras, CCD detectors, to link that to our observations and just get that little bit more out of it. The way a CCD works, it's the detector at which we record the photons that we collect with our reflector. That's an important component of the telescope. In the olden days, we used photographic plates. Now we have charge-coupled devices that record individual photons. We have to, th those are turned into an electrical signal. We have to read that electrical signal out pixel by pixel. And usually you can imagine it, it as a bucket brigade. Each pixel sort of passes its charge to the next one and then it gets read out at the end. I actually brought a checkerboard along if you want to. Let's have a look. Just dump that out. There you go. Okay, so you can imagine this checkerboard as being our detector. And normally, you would stare at a star and it would fall over a certain number of pixels in your camera. You would stare at it for a while, collect all of those photons, turn it into a digital signal, and then turn your exposure off and then read out those electrons. And you would do it by shuffling each charge along and reading it out on the side. And by that way, you could build up your two-dimensional image. So to do that, because of the rotation of the Earth, normally we have to slew our telescope to follow, to track that object so that it stays in the same place. Now, what is clever about drift scanning is if you tune the rate at which you read out those pixels to the rate at which that star is going across your field, it might start here it might move there and move there and move there because of the rotation of the Earth, but you are reading out along the way. So by the time it gets to the edge of your detector, you have each of those little snapshots that you can sort of put together. So this isn't, this isn't um, specific to these liquid mirror zenith telescopes. Other telescopes, particularly survey telescopes, use this kind of observing for efficiency. But I think it's really neat the way that you can marry the electronics the motion of the Earth and the construction of the telescope to make this kind of functional. I'm imagining your next question might be, but what are the long-term implications of this? You know, how is this competitive with all the other enormous telescopes that we're making all over the world? And so, you know, we're talking about crazy ideas here. Things, you know, innovative stuff doesn't get done unless somebody initially has a crazy idea like, hey, let's put a telescope up in space or something like that. And so some astronomers at the University of Texas have come up with the idea of building one of these on the moon. And so there you can imagine, okay, this is super heavy, sure, but it would be a lot easier to take a big jug of mercury, a big volume of mercury up to the moon and then pour it into your telescope, then take the equivalent pieces of glass and delicate optical um, components up there. Problem is you can't use mercury because although mercury is liquid here at room temperature, on the moon it would be solid. But uh, apparently, I understand that some new types of ionic liquids have been discovered that could possibly remain liquid even at that really, really cold temperature. Um, and might be useful for this kind of technique. So they're talking about a 100 meter diameter mirror on the moon without any of the detriments of looking through the atmosphere. And in typical creative astronomical fashion, we have the very large telescopes and we're building the extremely large telescope. So the proposal for this is the ultimately large telescope. This is a nice, motorized demonstration, but the surface is quite small. And so just for fun, I thought we'd go to a bigger container, but this one needs a little bit of um, elbow grease to get, get going. So I'll turn this one off because we're done with it. Uh, oh yeah. Okay, so we've got the same idea. Oh, I've made this wobble now. 
Same idea, we've got a cylinder with a bit of water in it, and it's on a turntable, but this turntable I have to move by hand. So. of very basic fluid dynamics and very basic laws of motion that Newton would have come up with himself. Isaac Newton would be proud of you. Yeah. Professor, how's this telescope working? It's up and running now. Has it, has it been a success? Yeah, well, like I said, they had a flurry of papers. I can't say that I've read them all in detail, but I've seen the first light pictures. We can show some of them on screen. And yeah, it's working. It's taking images. I'm sure that there will be future challenges along the way. That is absolutely the case with all new instrumentation and new telescopes. But as a separate party, I just think it's really nice to be exploring different kinds of technologies. Illustrates how imaginative scientists are. Uh, in, a, in approaching problems from different angles. Um, and I, I just find it very pleasing that this demonstration of very basic physics can be applied in such interesting ways. This is KMOS. Partly I'm excited because at the moment the instrument's actually detached from the Nazimuth, so you can see where they join, where that light comes out. Normally, obviously that would be right up flush against it. But bright yellow, no chance you're going to walk into that one. So here at UT1, it's just the same as all the others really. It looks the same, but it does have that special place in ESO history because this is where we had first light for the VLT uh, 